Welcome everyone to the Canadian Nurses Association's webinar series, Progress in Practice. This webinar is entitled Cannabis in Canada, Implications for Nursing in a Changing Legal and Healthcare Landscape. This session is being recorded for nurses who are unable to participate today. My name is Carrie Schuhendler. I am a registered nurse and policy advisor at the Canadian Nurses Association, and I will be hosting this webinar. At the end of the presentation, we will answer your questions, which you can type in the Q&A box that you see to the right of the slide. We will address as many questions as time allows. And now, a little about our presenter, Dr. Linda Balneves. Dr. Balneves is an associate professor in the University of Manitoba's College of Nursing. Her research is focused on supporting informed treatment decisions in people living with cancer. She is the principal investigator of the Complementary Medicine Education and Outcomes, or CAMEO, research program, which has developed and evaluated a variety of education and decision support interventions aimed at helping cancer patients and health professionals make evidence-informed decisions about complementary therapies. She has also conducted health, health services and policy research on the use of medical cannabis in Canada. This webinar is the fifth in a series about substance use trends in Canada. And now, I'll hand it over to Dr. Balneves. Thanks so much, Carrie. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be invited by the CNA to present to you today. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments at the end of the presentation. To begin, I just want to uh, say that I have no financial uh, conflict to disclose beyond the fact that I have a student at the University of British Columbia who is funded through the My Tax Funding Program. And that is funding from CAMCD, which is the Association of Medical Cannabis Dispensaries in Canada, the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, CCIC, as well as the FRIA, which is one of the licensed producers in Canada. In terms of the learning objectives, I'm going to start with just a really brief overview of what is cannabis. And then I'm going to dive into the past and current Canadian policy on medical as well as non-medical cannabis. I'm going to touch very briefly on what has been my research area for the past 10 years, understanding the patient experience of using medical cannabis. And then I'm going to talk about the potential risks as well as the benefits associated with cannabis use, so considering both medical and non-medical cannabis. And then we'll close the session in discussing the role of nurses related to cannabis use in Canada and what are some of the practice implications. So let's begin. What first comes to mind when you think of cannabis? This has been very much a stigmatized disease that has been associated with many different slang, different terminology, uh, and much of it is, is very pejorative. I, for many years, have seen the term marijuana, or as Health Canada termed it, marijuana, being used, which actually arose from uh, the 1940s and 50s when we saw uh, propaganda movies like Reefer Madness uh, come on board. And there was very much a racial uh, overtone uh, in terms of using that language. There's a lot of other terms that you may find patients and family members are using, and in talking to patients, I tend to use the terminology that they are using in order to normalize uh, the conversation and to get them to do full disclosure. However, when I'm talking to my colleagues, when I'm talking about it in a research or a practice context with, with fellow clinicians, I use this actual term, which is cannabis. And we're seeing movement uh, across most policymakers and clinical settings to try to use this terminology. I'm going to talk a little bit about non-medical and medical cannabis. To start off with, it's important to understand the context of cannabis use in Canada. And in terms of non-medical cannabis, just over 10% of the Canadian population that are 15 years or older are reporting using cannabis at least once in the past year. And that rate is double for males versus females. And when we look at daily cannabis use, over a quarter of those over the age of 15 years are reporting using it daily in the past three months. So this is a very significant health behavior. And the highest rates in Canada we see in British Columbia, which may not be a surprise to any of you that are living out there. And the lowest rates are in the prairies in Saskatchewan. When we turn to medical cannabis, there was a survey done in 2011 that suggested 420,000 Canadians were framing their cannabis use for therapeutic purposes. That's one in five adults reporting using cannabis for some type of medical reason. Half of them reported using it for chronic pain, and that's such things as lower back pain, uh, migraines, headaches, arthritis. 
When we look at the data from the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes regulation, which is the most recent medical cannabis legislation in Canada, we're at 130 Canadians and counting that are reporting using uh, cannabis and are authorized to use medical cannabis in Canada. And that rate seems to be increasing by about 25,000 Canadians every three to four months. So this is a rapidly growing field. And there's been some research in the past that suggests up to a million Canadians are framing their cannabis in a medical way. But what is cannabis? You know, if you look at it from an historical perspective, cannabis sativa is a fibrous plant that was very much used in agricultural settings for things like clothing, paper, as well as for ropes, which were often seen uh, related to the shipping industry. However, we also know that it's been used in the earliest writings of cannabis medically were back in China uh, around the year 106, where they were talking about its psychoactive properties as well as its ability to treat things like pain. Cannabis as a plant is made up of over 110 active compounds called cannabinoids, and we're still counting on those because research is still unfolding in terms of the actual structure of the plant. As well as cannabinoids, cannabis also has other structures in it, those things like terpenes, which are the aromatic oils that actually give cannabis its characteristic smell. And there's also flavonoids, which are things that are, um, uh, they act as antioxidants when we look in cell research and in mouse models. And we're just starting to understand how terpenes and flavonoids work uh, in the human body. In terms of the cannabinoids that have had the most research on it and we have the best understanding around, the first one that everyone is aware of typically is THC or delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's most well known because it has that high or that psychoactive effect that most people that are using it recreationally are using the plant for. But we also have had a growing body of research around cannabidiol or CBD which actually does not have the psychoactive effect of THC. It actually has an antipsychotic effect. It also has been shown in, in bench research to have an anticonvulsant effect. They also are act as antioxidants. And it's also thought to have an anti-inflammatory and analgesic effect. CBN or cabinol has weak psychoactive properties, but we've only seen research at the mouse or the cellular level, and we're really not clear of its effect in the human body at this time. What's really important to understand, uh, and there has been some debate about this, but we're starting to see research suggest that all of these cannabinoids work together in a synergistic manner, uh, and that we call this the entourage effect. And for many patients that are using it in a medical context, they prefer to use the herbal plants because they actually feel that they're getting a different effect than if they're using something like a NAB alone, where the THC has been isolated into a pharmaceutical agent. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Many of you as nurses, including myself, when I went through nursing school, I had no exposure to the endocannabinoid system. And it's, it's a system in our body that we're just, again, starting to understand. It's an endogenous system, and it's comprised of two main types of receptors, CB1 and CB2. And these are located throughout the whole body. It's one of those systems that seems to be prevalent in almost every major site of our body. CB1 is seen in the nervous system, in the brain, as well as in some organs. And CB2 is more prominent within the immune system. And so in understanding how endogenous cannabinoids in our body work, they seem to act as neuromodulators or immunomodulators in our body. And when exogenous cannabinoids like you know, THC or CBD come into our body, they seem to have the same effects as these endogenous cannabinoids. So for example, THC seems to inhibit the release of certain neurotransmitters, which result in increased release of dopamine, which is associated with that psychoactive effect. And this is just a little bit of a diagram to again just show how pervasive uh, the receptors are throughout our, our bodies and that may explain why we see such a range of effects that people report and that we're starting to have research on in terms of when people use cannabis, why we're seeing so many of our body systems being affected. That's a really quick overview. And for those of you that are interested in learning more about the physiological system, I encourage you to do your own reading 
or to go to sites like the CCIC, the Canadian Consortium of the Investigation of Cannabinoids, that actually have structured programs of education for health professionals, and you may find those, those courses useful. So let's jump a little bit into talking about legislation. I think this is important when you're talking to patients and to colleagues about the history of cannabis in Canada. In terms of uh, when medical marijuana became legal in Canada, it was back in 2001, and that was when the MMAR was legislated. And this was really because of patients demanding a legal and safe source of cannabis in this country. We had about 38,000 Canadians that registered under the MMAR, and they were allowed to either grow their own cannabis, designate someone to grow it, or there was one licensed producer in Canada that produced cannabis. However, there were some grave concerns about the difficulty patients had in accessing this program uh, through their physician. Uh, you had to have a specialist sign off almost a 25-page document, or you had to try you know, third or fourth line treatment before you were allowed to access cannabis. And as a consequence of that, in 2013, we saw the MMPR develop, and that was where we moved away from people personally producing their own cannabis, and we expanded the licensed producer system. And we had around 30 uh, licensed producers that were able to come forward and produce a variety of different cannabis strains and products for people that uh, were authorized by either a physician or a, life, a, a nurse practitioner. Um, there was, however, more concerns about the program, and uh, around 2013, we had injunctions come forward. The main concern was that the program was unconstitutional because people could not afford the program. Uh, many people uh, that are living with chronic health conditions said that they could not afford to be on disability and also pay for their medicine. There was also concern that through the Health Canada program, people were limited to dried cannabis uh, of varying quality. And many people said that they wanted to have uh, um, fresh cannabis. They were perhaps juicing or they were wanting to bake with it uh, or they were trying to create tinctures from it. And it was very difficult to do that with the dried cannabis. And there was more people that were interested in using cannabis oil for conditions like epilepsy as well as for cancer, which they felt avoided some of the potential harms of smoking cannabis, uh, and they felt that it would be uh, better uh, in terms of having access to it if they were traveling or being in a hospital setting. So in 2016, following the court injunctions, we saw the ACMPR uh, come into effect. This really tried to speak uh, to some of the safety concerns as well as some of the access concerns. So while we expanded the licensed producers even further, uh, we then saw people uh, being able to produce their cannabis again, as well as designate someone to produce it. Um, we have, I will have a slide on it right here. Uh, we now have 50 licensed producers and counting. They keep adding new ones in every two to three months. Uh, we also have some regulations around the amount of cannabis that people are allowed to have uh, per month. And they're have, allowed to have a maximum of 150 grams and that's related to a maximum of five grams a day for a 30-day supply. For those that are wishing to grow or designate a grower, they're allowed five indoor plants or two outdoor plants. And there are some very specific rules around production and access and storage, and that's really because of some concerns around people that were produ um, producing it in their homes and concerns around things like home invasions, electrical issues, mold, uh, and diversion to the illegal market or to youth. Um, and as I said, you know, nurse practitioners are allowed to authorize it. However, we're going to touch a little bit on some of the barriers to that. And as of December, there's 130,000 uh, Canadians that have been approved. And again, this seems to be increasing quite rapidly every three to four months as the stats get released. Um, and then the final point that I wanted to mention in terms of legislation is Bill 45, which is the Cannabis Act, which is supposed to come into effect in July 2018. You know, a lot of people think Canada is one of the first countries to be legalizing uh, uh, non-medical cannabis, but actually Uruguay was the first country uh, to go down this road. And eight uh, U.S. states have followed suit. Uh, and that's been really important for us as researchers because it's given us uh, a little bit of a 
you know, a picture of what legalization is going to look like, what some of the problems may be related to legalization, and what could be some of the potential benefits of legalization. There's a lot of questions that remain um, because this new legislation has really put the onus on the provinces and territories to determine how it's going to be regulated and dispensed and distributed in each region. So there's some real question marks about, you know, will the non-medical cannabis be distributed through licensed producers? Will it be sold alongside liquor in liquor stores, which I have some, some concerns about? Pharmacies have expressed uh, interest in being part of the distribution system, and many community-based dispensaries, which are currently illegal in Canada, uh, have expressed interest in being part of the dispensing system. You know, the, the Bill 45 is really focused on harm reduction. They've set at this time the minimum age of accessing their medical cannabis to be 18 years. They followed the ACMPR by saying that you can have a maximum um, of 30 grams of legal cannabis. I think that's wrong. I think it's 150 grams of legal cannabis. Um, I'll have to check on that. My apologies. There's restrictions around advertising, very similar to tobacco. There's going to be warnings on, uh, on any type of cannabis product. There's going to be limits on how this is advertised. They're not going to be allowed to target youth. There's stiff penalties up to 14 years in prison for those that are selling or engaging youth in distribution. They must be public education attached to the legalization of cannabis around the risks and problematic use. And they're really working towards a price and tax system that's going to balance health protection with a reduction in the illicit market. If cannabis is priced too high and the taxes are too high, the illegal system will remain, which could cause some real problems in terms of youth accessing that market as well as contamination of product, including, including with such things as fentanyl, which we are having such a crisis about in Canada at this time. There are also some real focus on the safe and responsible supply chain. So while it's regulated, as I mentioned, at the federal level, distribution and retail is going to be at the provincial level. So it is possible we're going to have provinces that will say, we're, we're not accepting 18 years of age as the minimum age. We want to raise it up to 22 or 25. Um, there may be provinces and territories that say we do not want this distributed uh, and controlled in our province. And if that occurs, the federal government has indicated that there can be direct-to-consumer mail order where retail services are not uh, available. And as I mentioned, personal production will be part of this system. You'll be allowed a maximum of four plants per resident, not per person. You can only grow from legal seed or seedlings. And the maximum height is one meter. And you must ensure that you have responsible growing and security measures surrounding any uh, home grow ops. The only issue is, is how is that actually going to be monitored and assessed? Because uh, that will be a, an incredible burden on the province, and you know already there's a lot of burden on a regulation of the medical uh, cannabis market. I just want to quickly uh, note, Health Canada has a lot of, of information online, and I encourage you to go to Health Canada's website. There are some web links below that you may find of interest. What I'm finding is that a lot of Canadians think because of all the media attention associated uh, with uh, cannabis and the legalization that people think it's legal. You know, we have many con uh, community dispensaries that are, are popping up in our communities that are not legal at this time, that people think are legal. Uh, so I think it's important to remind uh, patients and, you know, community partners that you're working with that until July 2018 or whenever this legislation comes into effect, Possession of cannabis is still illegal unless you're authorized to use it through the ACMPR. So I just want to quickly touch on some of the potential impacts of legalization on medical cannabis. And you know, I'm partial to this because it's, it's my research area. You know, at this time, Bill 45 indicates that there must be a separate medical cannabis system from the non-medical system, which I was quite happy to see. You know, in some ways, this may increase the source of cannabis in Canada. Some of my research has suggested that patients are struggling to sometimes find the strain and the product uh, through the licensed producers because they don't have enough product. And so by legalizing it, we may have more licensed producers come in uh, into play and we'll have more product available to patients. We may also see a reduction in cost. 
that as licensed producers are able to make a more rapid profit in an unmedical market, they may be able to transfer some of that profit into savings for people that are living uh, on disability and may be struggling to pay for their, their medical cannabis. We may see a, a more diversity in the quality and type of cannabis. However, I'm a bit concerned that we're going to see many licensed producers focusing their product development on cannabis that is, has high THC that would cause a more rapid psychoactive effect. And we'll see less attention by some licensed producers on the medical forms of cannabis. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but in terms of creating strains that have higher CBD and less psychoactive effects, but may have a role in treating things like seizure disorders or Parkinson's or some side effects of cancer. So we may, it will be interesting to see what unfolds. I've spoken to some licensed producers that have indicated that they're solely going to be focusing on the medical market and they're not interested in the license, uh, like being a licensed producer for, for recreational use. So we'll see what unfolds. I am concerned that we're going to be seeing more stigma associated with cannabis use. I already am seeing the media, I'm seeing the CIHR, the Canadian Institute for Health Research, focusing their energy and attention towards non-medical cannabis use and the potential societal harms. And as we see more and more attention paid to that, it will demonize cannabis even further and it may restrict the funding and the attention that's needed towards research on the therapeutic purposes of cannabis. You know, Bill 45 does indicate we need uh, that they've legislated that there must be education to the public about the use of cannabis, so hopefully we will see more attention to cannabis and it will become less of a stigmatized medicine in terms of talking about it and, and having conversations with patients about it and addressing things like harm reduction. Um, but it will be intriguing to see how legalization actually affects uh, the medical cannabis world. So I'm going to really briefly take my 10 years of, of research uh, and slum it down into, into two slides only. So uh, to start off with, I wanted to just talk about the hemp study that uh, I did with my colleague Joan Petorf uh, back in 2010. And that was really focusing on the access experience of people under the original MMAR program. And the patients at that time told us that they experienced a great deal of gatekeeping behavior by physicians who outright refused to sign documentation to access legal cannabis for medical purposes, or they delay, delayed up to a year in signing the medical documentation. The patients said that they experienced significant stigma. They were called, you know, potheads. They were told that they had a substance abuse problem. They were referred to addiction services. Uh, they were, you know, you know, pulled aside by law enforcement when they were using medicine uh, in public settings or trying to use it in hospital settings. And those that were living in things like social housing said that they often were kicked out of their social housing for using uh, medical cannabis. And in many ways, it marginalized uh, an already underserved population. And as a consequence, um, they had to go to secondary illegal sources to address these access issues. Many people had to go back to street sources or they illegally grew it in their own homes. Um, and, you know, those that did go through the one LP that was available, so they had a lot of dissatisfaction with the product. It was irradiated, it was dried, it was basically crumbled dust for many patients when they finally got it, and they said they weren't able to use it uh, in that form. Um, but overall, patients told us that they saw the health benefits of using medical cannabis far outweighed any of the perceived health or social risks that they associated in using cannabis. The Canary study is one that we're just wrapping up, and this is being conducted by uh, Rial Kasser at University of British Columbia. And Rial conducted a cross-sectional survey of just close to 370 Canadians that were using it under the legal as well as the illegal systems in Canada. Majority of people were using it for some form of pain relief. People also had it, uh, the sleep as well as mental health issues. We have a great deal of Canadians that are using cannabis and self-reporting using it for things like anxiety, for depression, for you know, sleep uh, issues related to those mental health issues. What was intriguing is that close to 50% and over 50% of those still under the MMAR were reporting using illegal sources. And this was because half of our samples still had difficulties accessing cannabis. Patients still experienced gatekeeping behaviors by their health professionals. 
they struggled to get the, the strain or the uh, product that they wanted from their licensed producers. They often, after two to three months, ran out of um, that material, and that's because we did this survey at the very beginning of the LPs, so many of them were still getting their businesses kind of set up and getting their production uh, organized. Um, and they also cited costs, that many patients said, I still can't afford um, legal cannabis through the licensed producers, uh, and that many people still had to wait a month to two months. And if you're living with a terminal illness or you're recently been diagnosed with cancer and undergoing treatment, for some patients they said that wait was too long and that it was easier to access it through the illicit market. So that's just very briefly a context of some of the patient's experiences related to medical cannabis. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the risks as well as the potential benefits of cannabis. And this is a rapidly unfolding field, so bear with me. There's a lot of needs more research that's going to be said in this section. I do have some important caveats, though. You know, most of the research on benefits has been really focused on pharmaceutical forms of cannabis, and we may not always be able to relate this back to when people use herbal cannabis. And the research on the risk, a lot of it has focused on high, you know, high use, chronic use from recreational users of cannabis. And again, those risks may not apply when someone is using cannabis for medical purposes and may be, you know, vaporizing one gram at nighttime for sleep issues. It may not be the same as someone that is smoking three joints throughout the day. So let's move into some of these. It's important when you're thinking about the health effects, both positive and negative, of THC and CBD to understand the various effects that have been associated with cannabis. And when you look at this chart, I think what's really interesting is that, you know, THC and CBD sometimes have similar effects. So as an anticonvulsant, CBD is well known, but THC may also have a role. You know, as an antiemetic, both THC and CBD seem to have a role. But if you're looking at something like appetite, THC has much more of a role and CBD doesn't seem to have an effect at all. So understanding, you know, the different effects of these different cannabinoids is really important when you're talking to patients about the type of cannabis that they're using and why they're using it, because they may be using a cannabis that doesn't have the effect that they're looking for, um, and, you know, it may be important as we move forward in terms of authorizing patients in terms of the type of information that we provide them. In terms of the potential benefits of cannabis, I think the one that we see, you know, most prominent in the research is its role as an analgesic agent. As I mentioned, both THC and CBD have an analgesic effect. There's been a variety of research. There's been a lot that's been recently focused on managing neuropathic pain, both because of surgery, HIV, and we're starting to see research focused in, in cancer uh, as well. And it does seem that smoked or vaporized cannabis is effective in managing uh, pain, neuropathic pain, and CBD in animal models has been shown to be effective in managing CIPN. There's been some pilot studies done, but only 16 people, so it's really hard to, to draw any conclusions from such a small study to suggest that pharmaceutical forms like Nimbixamol, which is Sedevex, which is a balanced formula of THC and CBD, didn't have an effect on, on neuropathic pain. However, there's been some pilot data to suggest, and this is from Donald Abrams at UCSF, that cannabis may work synergistically with opioids without increasing some of the negative side effects like somnolence, uh, and that it, it, we don't see, you know, repression in things like respiration. And um, there's actually some research that's come out very recently to suggest that when cannabis is used with opioids, we see less use of opioids as breakthrough medication and that people report better pain management. And I'm starting to hear pain management researchers suggest that we may need to start changing the model in terms of what medications we recommend. And as we get more human studies on herbal cannabis as well as some of the pharmaceutical cannabis in terms of pain management, maybe cannabis needs to start coming before we start prescribing opioids. So this is definitely an evolving field. In terms of nausea and vomiting, again, THC and CBD both seem to have a role in managing nausea, secondary to chemotherapy and cancer. We've seen a little bit of research to suggest that it may also play a role in people that are living with HIV AIDS 
and are having uh, nausea and vomiting related to some of the antivirals. Uh, and this is actually approved in Canada uh, to use um, uh, in, in cancer patients. Some patients may prefer to use herbal cannabis or oral cannabis because they feel that the onset, particularly with vaporized or smoked cannabis, is more rapid than taking pharmaceutical antiemetics. Uh, and also it can help people with their appetite. Uh, the next uh, point is that both, again, THC and CBD stimulate appetite. However, there was some thought that it could help people that are living with cachexia, secondary to cancer and HIV AIDS. And the beginning research suggests that while it stimulates people's appetite, it doesn't actually address some of the metabolic, uh, metabolism issues related to cachexia, and people are not actually gaining weight. However, it may help people, and if eating is something important for someone at end of life in a social context, cannabis may, may play a role in that. In terms of sleep problems, uh, there is beginning research, a summary was done by Babson, suggests that both THC and CBD may help people living with insomnia, help them with their sleep latency issues, sleep apnea, and there's starting to be research. Um, we have a couple of researchers actually in Canada, Zachary Walsh is one at UBCO, that's focusing on the role of cannabis in managing night terrors in people that are living with PTSD, including veterans. Uh, and there's been some discussion within cancer communities that for individuals that are living with a great deal of anxiety and, and PTSD from their cancer diagnosis and treatment experience, that cannabis has been helpful in, in managing those sleep issues. Many of you have maybe heard of Charlotte's Web. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very rich uh, oil and CBD um, that was used in the United States uh, in a case study with a young girl that had intractable seizures, uh, Dervais syndrome, that was not being able to be addressed through conventional means. Uh, and there's some very persuasive case studies that have come since that time with pediatric epileptic, epileptic patients, excuse me, that a, a cannabis product very rich in CBD may reduce severe frequency. Uh, and there are clinical trials currently underway under clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, seeing if this actually is, applies to a larger population. Um, and so it will be interesting to see if this becomes part of the treatment protocol for people living with uh, epilepsy. In terms of antispasticity, uh, we know that in MS patients, they have reported that smoking cannabis or using the dimixamols, like a Sedevex, has found to reduce the, the, the frequency of spasms and related pains. Um, again, has this moved into clinical guidelines? I think. People are waiting for more research, larger studies well designed in order to move in that direction. Um, there's been some discussion that because there seems to need, there's a need to have a high THC uh, to control muscle spasms, that they're really, patients are using a combined formula with high CBD as well to help reduce some of the adverse effects associated with THC, most notably the, the, the high that people can experience as well as some of the anxiety. Very quickly, we have a ton of cannabinoid receptors in our gut, uh, and so there's beginning research to suggest that smoked cannabis may improve some of the symptoms of people living with ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease. This is very much kind of case studies and observational work. We need to move into clinical trials to be able to speak to this even further. I've also heard of uh, parents of children with autism looking at using cannabis oil to manage some of the gut issues that some of those children experience. In terms of anti-anxiety and PTSD, this is kind of one of these, these challenging areas in cannabis research because we know that cannabis can increase and heighten people's anxiety. However, there's so many people that are also reporting that they're using it to control their anxiety as well. And as I mentioned, we're starting to see a real focus in, uh, through the Department of Defense on the potential role of cannabis in managing PTSD. In, in veterans and individuals that have uh, served in, in uh, crisis situations. And we're also starting to see research that CBD may have an anti-anxiety uh, effect, which would mean that we could avoid some of that psychoactive effect from THC. But we really have insufficient research to be able to make any conclusions. And now cancer, uh, which is my research area, hence the larger size. But um, there's been an enormous amount of cell studies uh, that have gone on and are going on right now that are really trying to understand the role of the different cannabinoids in potentially the treatment of cancer. We have seen in breast, prostate, 
lung, colorectal, melanoma, and the most recent one was just two days ago, lymphoma uh, and leukemia, that cannabinoids seem to play a role in promoting cancer cell death and preventing growth, preventing migration of cancer cells throughout the body, as well as angiogenesis where blood vessels are being grown towards a tumor. That, though, has been at the cell level. And so what does that mean when we transfer it into the human body? And at this time, there's only two very small trials that have been conducted with people with reoccurrent glioblastoma. In those trials, and they use CETAVEX, which is um, or the second trial, the unpublished CETAVEX trial, the first one by Guzman, which is done in Spain, was where they actually injected um, a very rich compound with THC into the actual brain tumor. The CETAVEX trial, they did 12 puffs of CETAVEX a day. They saw a significant reduction in tumor size, and in the CETAVEX trial, people lived an additional 200 days uh, beyond um, the, the control group, which is quite significant in that population. So those are only been done with under 25 people. We need to expand that to a much larger population, and I believe with the positive CETAVEX trial, we'll be seeing those trials coming forward now. And then another controversial area, uh, the use of cannabis in substance use disorder. There's beginning interest in whether cannabis, particularly CBD, can help ease some of the withdrawal symptoms that people may experience in using narcotics, or sorry, in using cannabis uh, chronically, as well as tobacco use. We also have some surveys, and there's research happening here in Canada, for example, with Philippe Lucas, that's looking at people using cannabis as a substitute for illicit drugs like opioids and fentanyl, as well as for alcohol. And there has been a small study done that's shown that people have also used it to reduce their use of tobacco. So this is a, it's an intriguing thing to replace one drug with another, but in many ways that's, that's sometimes what we do in the field of harm reduction. So it'll be intriguing to see if cannabis will play an actual role in that. In terms of the risks, and I'm gonna speed up a little bit here, there's a whole host of physiological effects. This is not a drug that is, is without any harm, and I believe a lot of recreational users see it as quite safe. It has similar cardiovascular effects as tobacco. It has, uh, we do see hyperemesis syndrome, which is quite rare, but where people get severe nausea and vomiting associated with it. It's thought to be uh, potentially the result, not of, of, of necessarily an overdose, but more of chronic use, where actually there could be that the receptors are just overstimulated uh, in some individuals and they just can't take uh, additional use. Um, we have seen lung uh, health issues. We haven't seen the link to lung cancer. It's been explored extensively. We haven't found that conclusive link yet, but it does definitely worsen asthma and irritate uh, the lung and lung tissue. There are concerns, especially with non-legal cannabis, about contaminants. And there is beginning research to uh, suggest there's embryotic uh, uh, negative effects from smoking cannabis, so women that are using it to ma manage their nausea. This is not recommended, and there's been some case studies that it may be linked to early pregnancy failure. Like any drug, it's metabolized through various systems in our body. This one is through the P450 system. So there needs to be a discussion if people are using this medically or non-medically if it could impact uh, the um, uptake of other medications they may be taking, and it does potentiate other sedatives like alcohol and barbiturates, but again, some of the research with opioids suggests that it doesn't have a synergistic effect in that manner. In terms of cognitive functioning, I think it's quite well known that it, it, it negatively affects cognitive functioning. It affects concentration, short term. There's starting to be research on long term memory. It definitely affects motivation and things like work attainment, you know, academic attainment in youth, and there's contradictory, contradictory data about, uh, you know, use of cannabis in, in young people and whether it negatively affects IQ. There's been some suggestion that low use actually improves IQ, and another it, it, high use is suggested to lower IQ. In terms of mental health issues, there's a great deal of debate in this field about whether people are addicted to cannabis versus are they dependent on cannabis? And that usually comes down to whether we see the classic withdrawal symptoms from cannabis versus other types of narcotics. Definitely we see about just under 10% of cannabis users have some form of dependency, be it physiological or be it psychological in using cannabis. We also can see in some individuals, especially those that are naive to cannabis, that they have anxiety 
And in people that have a propensity towards schizophrenia, there seems to be early onset, particularly in people that are using cannabis at a young age. And we also can see psychosis. We have seen instances of this where people are using edibles, are not using them wisely, consuming massive amounts. And we do see psychotic episodes that can result in suicidal behavior as well as very violent behavior. In terms of public safety, it does impair people's psychomotor impairment. So it does affect people when they're driving. Research is suggesting they're two to six more times likely to be in an accident. However, that research has been confounded because it didn't control for alcohol consumption. We know that when people drive and smoke and are drinking as well, that the risk of accidents is exponentially higher. And that's why co-selling cannabis and alcohol together is such a bad idea. We also have to be thinking that if this becomes legal and normalized in society, we do have to be thinking about work safety for people that are in construction, for people that are, you know, I've had nursing associations ask me about nurses that are smoking it, you know, recreationally, not once it becomes legal. You know, it's, we're really going to have to be thinking about levels of impairment and the type of work that people are doing. And cannabis is going to be tricky because it's fat soluble and it remains in our body for 20, 22 days. Uh, and so doing blood tests for it may not accurately indicate whether someone is impaired or not. Um, and obviously there's personal production. When people start growing this at home, we have to be aware that there could be harm to our communities in doing that, and we also have to ensure that there's not access by minors. You know, I do want to, to comment that when Bill uh, 45 was coming forward, they also revised uh, Bill C-46 around impaired driving. You know, and we are moving closer and closer to having reliable screening aids at the roadside to be able to detect if there's drugs in the body, uh, which would then lead to, uh, you know, testing for impairment. They're not perfect, and their lack of reliability is going to be a real issue I see in the courts. Uh, but the proposed levels of THC that are seen to be offense are listed there. And as people get caught um, repeatedly, the fines and the risk of um, incarceration will rapidly increase. So, you know, they are taking a very hard line in terms of driving and smoking or consumption of cannabis. And just a quick comment about youth. Canada has in the world one of the highest rates of youth use of cannabis. And there are some real unique concerns because we have seen at bench, plea clinical, as well as clinical studies that it has a negative impact on brain development as well as their attainment at school as well as at work. So the earlier the use, the worse the outcomes. Uh, and we really, uh, and I'm sorry, there's a little bit of a wobble there on the slide, but you know, the recommendation that I'm hearing repeatedly is that we really should be limiting use until the age of 25. And obviously, this has to have some slippage if people are using it, children are using it for medical purposes, um, but uh, 25 is the age recommended for, for non-legal uh, cannabis, or sorry, for recreational cannabis. However, the Liberal government didn't go in that direction because they were worried that that would still encourage the illicit market. Um, there's a great deal more research that needs to be done, and I'm going to be speeding up a little bit here. Uh, we need to understand a lot more about the strains and the ratios of THC and CBD, dosages and routes of administration. We need to be comparing cannabis as a therapeutic agent to other therapeutic agents, and we really need to understand whether cannabis can be an exit drug out of addiction. Uh, for some individuals. Okay, so let's jump into the implications for nursing. And my apologies, I am going to go through this quite quickly. So I'm going to be going through five main issues. And let's really start with the one that I get a lot of questions about, which is prescribing and authorizing. So to start off with, it's not a prescription at this time, it's an authorization. And there are a growing number of, of provinces and territories throughout Canada that are allowing nurse practitioners to prescribe controlled substances, including pharmaceutical forms of cannabis. However, when it comes to herbal cannabis, Ontario is the only province that I'm knowledgeable of right now that has allowed NPs to authorize herbal cannabis. And we still have provinces that are actively cautioning NPs against authorization. And the, the, the CNPS is still recommending that NPs and RNs not engage patients uh, around medical cannabis at this time. And I, I think there's just some fears about 
our legal standing, as well as the level of evidence that's available at this time. Obviously, if you are an individual that's going to be authorizing a patient, you need to be up to date on the latest evidence, uh, and you need to make sure that your clinical institution allows you and your provincial or territorial institution or organization allows you to actually authorize it. You know, just very quickly, there are several prescription uh, cannabinoids in Canada, the mixamols I've spoken about, nabilone is another one you may be familiar with, or adrenabinol, which I haven't seen being used as much uh, lately. You know, if you are a person that's going to be authorizing, you know, these are some real important points. You need to have a complete evaluation of the patient. It has to be a bona fide relationship. This isn't a patient that just popped into your office and 20 minutes later they walk out with an authorization. Obviously informed consent. You need to be talking to the rest of their healthcare team so that they're aware of this authorization and what has been authorized. Obviously screen for some of the contraindications and precautions that we've talked about today. Um, and establish whether they've tried other options and what has the effect been, set a treatment goal, do a follow-up in a month, in three months, and really determine whether this is a treatment route that the patient is benefiting from, and obviously document. You know, and there's just some little points. You know, the big point here around authorizing cannabis is, you know, being clear about the daily quantity of cannabis that is being authorized, and it's done in dried cannabis, and then the LPs do a conversion if they use oil, if they use fresh, uh, and you have, can give them a period of use. You can say, we're just doing this for three months until your trial of using it is done, and then we'll reevaluate at this time. Um, as I mentioned, it's available through LPs, dried, fresh, or cannabis oil. You know, the LPs, if you go online, they have a whole range of different products in terms of the amount of THC and CBD that are in it. Um, and in terms of strains, we're still doing research to understand the different effects that different strains have. Patients have a lot of anecdotal stories around it, um, but this is something that you may want to talk to your patient about. In terms of routes of administration, we, you know, smoked and vaporized are popular because the onset is very rapid within five minutes and it lasts for only two to four hours, whereas if you consume it through an edible or a tincture, the onset can be up to an hour and the duration can be much longer, eight to 12. So you may find people doing edibles at nighttime and using smoke and vaporize during the day. And topicals, we're just starting to understand their role in things like analgesia. This is an example of nursing a vaporizer. That's kind of what they look like. And dose, we need a lot more research on this. You know, we're just trying to understand whether cannabis could even have a role in, in, in managing many conditions. In terms of understanding doses, Health Canada says the mean amount is 2.6 grams a day. And if you kind of try to convert that to a joint, most joints are between 0.3 to 0.75 grams of cannabis. Uh, and vaporization seems to result in the same dose and plasma uh, concentration. The big advice I often, you know, when I talk to people that are, are in the clinical setting, is you start at the lowest dose and you go slow in terms of titrating up. Um, and patients will be the ones that can really determine what type of side effects they're having and where they're getting symptom relief. Um, under the ACMPR, you are allowed to assist an authorized individual in taking medical cannabis. But you must have the competency as well as the authority uh, to be assisting that client. So you need to be talking to your institution. You probably will need a physician order or an NP order. You need to obviously be documenting it, and you need to ensure there's appropriate uh, storage and disposal. But as I mentioned, the CMPS is discouraging at this time. You know, nurses are going to have a huge role in harm reduction strategies, you know, in terms of helping people make decisions about using medical and non-medical cannabis, and really doing it in a way that's non-judgmental and trying to avoid stigma. Cannabis, for all intents and purposes, compared to other narcotics, has a good safety profile. There's a moderate, low to moderate risk for dependency. They need to balance that, you know, against the potential therapeutic benefits. And we're well positioned to be assessing these sorts of things. If you're concerned about someone, you know, use one of these screening tests, the QDIT R, the TAST, you know, to really understand is there problematic use. But consider why you're screening in the context. If this is someone with end stage cancer, Trying to assess their problematic use may not be appropriate. So, so you know, use your, your nursing skills and, and your empathy in, in, in assessing harm reduction issues. You know, we don't recommend cannabis be used with alcohol and tobacco 
avoid using it prior to driving at least four hours after consumption. You know, instead of smoking, vaporization is seen to be safer. Don't be sharing, you know, instruments because of the risk of hepatitis and other communicable diseases. You know, we've talked about the harms around youth being pregnant, having a mental health issues. And if they're using cannabis for the first time, do it with someone that's a trusted other in case there is a psychosis or an anxiety attack attached to it. You know, and there's some great resources through the Canadian Center of Substance Use and Addiction around talking to people about cannabis, particularly youth, as well as through CAMH in Toronto. And a great resource that I often don't see discussed is Take Care with Cannabis that was produced through UVic and the Vancouver Coastal Health. It's a great little brochure that you can order or print off and it really has a common sense approach in youth language about using cannabis. And obviously, very quickly, you know, we have a role in educating our patients. We have a role to get educated uh, and talking to our colleagues that may not know about cannabis. And we have a role in doing research and advocating for research and supporting researchers in getting their, their studies done. Um, there's a lot of research that needs to be done in this field. And we also have a role in developing health policies. If your institution doesn't have a policy on medical cannabis, talk to someone about it. Talk to the pharmacy department. Talk to, you know, the CEO. Because this is be going to become a growing uh, question and issue when, in working with patients. You know, engage in policy development. Talk to your colleges and your associations about getting, you know, a, a practice standard around this to get a position paper out on it so that your fellow nurses, uh, you know, know where their organizations stand on the use of it. Um, you know, and again, there are some great resources. I've, these are down below. If there's going to be one resource, if you're thinking about being more knowledgeable about ca uh, cannabis, go to Health Canada's Practitioner Guide. It's 170 pages, but it's, it's worth the read. You know, cannabis is, is a growing health issue in Canada. I really see nurses as taking a leading role, not only in harm reduction and supporting safe consumption, but helping Canadians make informed decisions that are not stigmatized about medical and unmedical use. You know, there's going to be a lot of challenges around legalization as well as opportunities, and we have to be prepared for it. Pharmacists are stepping forward. The physicians are stepping forward. Nurses need to be stepping forward and saying, we want to be part of this. You know, seek the education and training you need. You know, you guys are here because you're seeking it. There's other resources that can further your knowledge. And the evidence is changing rapidly. Get on to PubMed, CINAHL, you know, stay current because this is going to be a rapidly evolving field. So thank you so much. Uh, I know Carrie's going to jump in and do some poll questions for you, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions. I can stay a bit later if you guys can as well. Wonderful. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Balneves. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A, uh, as was mentioned, we have um, a couple of poll questions we'd like, we'd like to ask you. So if you can go ahead and, and click on your answers for those. I see people are already doing so, so thank you. Um, the first is, how likely are you to use this information provided in the webinar uh, in your day? So uh, we'll just let that continue to, to have the answers come in. Um, we're having about the, the largest proportion of people are saying that they're very likely. So I, uh, we're thrilled that this has been a, a useful topic. It's d definitely very timely. Um, and, uh, and we're thrilled to have uh, Dr. Balneves be able to present uh, to our audience here. And in terms of uh, number of individuals, uh, that's just some information that we like to keep track of to know the, how, what kind of reach the presentation has had. Great, so I think we're going to uh, close the polls. And uh, we can start with the discussion portion of the webinar. Um, if you haven't already, please type your questions into the Q&A text box that you see to the right of the slide. And I did also uh, want to mention that um, CNA has been developing a, a harm reduction uh, for non-medical cannabis document that is uh, in editing at the moment and should be released shortly, too. So uh, that will be available on CNA's website in the coming weeks. Um, so, uh, Dr. Balneves, we have quite a number of questions about um, implications for nurses and uh, namely uh, the difference between administration and its assistance and, um, and even some uh, discordant opinions between uh, regulatory bodies and CNPS. So uh, are you comfortable to speak to that, knowing that uh, we're not providing the definitive opinion of CNPS? 
Sure, and I, I'm sorry, I, I just noticed there's been a lot of problems with the sound, and my apologies, I wasn't able to be viewing that while I was presenting, so hopefully this is better. Um, you know, I, I think because this field is so rapidly evolving, there is, um, you know, there's a lot of different perspectives on it, and I think we need to recognize that cannabis is a very stigmatized uh, product, so we are, you know, we're getting a lot of remnants of that as well in terms of people's um, perception of this and, and where we're moving. You know, I think, number one, as nurses, you legally know, need to know where you stand in terms of your license uh, and your college, so I would recommend that's your first place to kind of go. Um, if you are, you know, if you are going to, um, you know, be authorizing it, I think it's important to talk to whoever is providing your insurance about what kind of coverage that you would have and how you could go about it most safely. You know, we have a great deal of physicians in this country that are authorizing. It may be worth also a phone call uh, to, you know, the College of Physicians as well to see what kind of recommendations they're giving to their members to ensure that you are following the same type of procedures. Um, if you are working with someone that is authorized to use cannabis, this is a, considered a medicine in Canada and should be treated in the exact same way as you would someone that has a prescription for uh, a narcotic. The difficulty becomes we don't have the evidence base around dose, around routes of administration, around strains. So it becomes quite difficult, uh, you know, if there was any type of a legal challenge or a lawsuit to be able to pull from the research to say this is why I gave the recommendation I gave. And that is why we often see people saying start low and go slow and document each step of the way in terms of what dose was, was recommended, what was the effects, when was the decision made to increase the dose and then more follow-up attached to it. You know, uh, I was a bit surprised about the CNPS, um, you know, response, um, and I believe they're trying to err on the side of, of caution, which I, which I understand. Uh, that being said, I think we need to balance it against harm reduction, that if our patients are unable to access cannabis, if they're wanting to use it for a therapeutic purpose and they are uh, refused, they will then access it through an, an illicit market, which there may be harms attached to that. Um, so um, each nurse must kind of ask themselves, uh, how can I best approach this in a way that is going to benefit my client, uh, reduce harm, and hopefully provide them with the best outcome in terms of their health. And I would predict that as more research is conducted in this field, we will be able to get um, uh, more uh, clearer kind of legal standing uh, for nurses in this country. Great, thank you. And uh, we have a question around uh, whether or not patients can bring medical cannabis into hospital if authorized for them in the community. And um, what about access once they're in uh, an acute care facility? Yeah, that really seems to vary by institution. Uh, I've seen some institutions where it's, it's been allowed and they treat it the way they would treat any other type of narcotic. Uh, and then there's other institutions which have just flat out said and, and you can't come in um, with anything that you know hasn't been prescribed within the hospital setting. Um, and uh, there's concerns. Often it gets tangled up with smoking bylaws in hospitals, particularly if people are wanting to smoke or vaporize cannabis, that there's really no place for them to be able to do that. Um, and there's also the fact that in some institutions, the health professionals say that I don't have the knowledge to be able to supervise and assess and document the use of cannabis. Uh, and as a consequence, it's, it's not allowed. Um, that's, again, where I really see nurses as playing a leading role in advocating for some clearer policies. Uh, and, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, we will start seeing, you know, probably legal action taken when people are not able to access uh, medication that they ha are legally allowed uh, to use in Canada. So, uh, and, you know, I you know, was a nurse in Winnipeg, and the last thing I wanted to see, which I did see, was people, you know, hiding in the loading dock, you know, smoking their cannabis in minus 30 weather. So I think we need to come up with some creative strategies, but it, it is a struggle for people. And, and the other option is is that you work with the patient and the healthcare team to see if uh, something like a set of X would be an acceptable substitution while that person is hospitalized. Thank you. 
and the, the questions keep rolling in. So uh, as we had said, uh, the webinar was scheduled to end at 1, but we'll, um, because uh, Dr. Balneves has generously offered more of her time, we'll continue and try to answer as many as possible as time allows. Um, if we don't get to your question, we will uh, try and answer them individually after the fact. So uh, we do have some questions about terminology, too. Um, you know, uh, someone has asked if there's better terms to use than recreational cannabis or non-medical cannabis because um, there are implications associated with those those terms, yeah. similar to what you had said at the beginning. Yeah, yeah and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to move away from recreational cannabis. It's been what's been used for, for many years. Uh, I'm trying to move away from it because I... I don't want to be kind of promoting cannabis as something, you know, like I'm going to go to the recreational gym, I'm going to, you know, do recreational sports. Uh, to me, you know, using any type of substance is something that has to be treated seriously. So there's been a movement away from using the term recreational, and that's where the non-medical cannabis has been coming from. However, I've also heard from the patient advocacy community that they're wanting to move away from any terminology and just simply call it cannabis. However, I think we need to be making the distinction because I think there's different implications in working with patients depending on the reasons of why they're using cannabis. Great, thank you. Um, so in terms of pain management, uh, can cannabis be used to replace opioids in uh, patients with opioid uh, use disorder? You know, we're just starting to understand the, uh, you know, the, the relationship between opioids and cannabis. There is starting to be some research where cannabis is being used uh, to manage the withdrawal from using opioids. Um, that research is, you know, quite positive, uh, but we need some larger studies to show whether cannabis, you know, uh, can be successful in weaning people off of using opioids. And then, of course, the question will become, what is the long-term impact of using cannabis in that context? Um, and then do we need to, to wean people off a of dependency of using cannabis? Um, you know, what's been interesting about uh, some of the epidemiological research of states that have uh, legalized cannabis is that we've seen an overall reduction in opioid prescription and prescription use uh, in those states that have legalized cannabis. And in anecdotally uh, talking uh, um, to people as well as some of the Canadian surveys that have been done, patients are telling us that they themselves are reducing their opioid use by using cannabis instead. So. You know, with our opioid crisis, this may be uh, an exit way out of it, but we have to make sure we do the research to ensure that we're not creating another health issue. Thank you. And in terms of, um, of pain management uh, for patients uh, pre and post-op, uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, do patients require more narcotics to control um, post-op pain? And uh, what type of recommendations would there be around um, post-op teaching uh, with regards to narcotics and uh, cannabis use? So this is an interesting question. And, you know, I, I just today found one small study that was actually done in Jamaica where they looked at cannabis users versus non-users. Uh, and they found that those who reported chronic cannabis use reported greater post-op pain as well as needed greater uh, rescue doses uh, in, the, in the recovery period. So, you know, there, there was some suggestion that there was a, a, a relationship between using cannabis chronically as well as uh, the, the amount of rescue medication that was needed. That study, though, only had, you know, under 60 people in it. We need to do a lot more research to understand its role. Um, you know, I think like we would uh, for any type of surgical procedure, I think we would want to have a conversation about, you know, their smoking habits, be it tobacco or cannabis, um, because we know that, you know, cannabis is, is processed through the, you know, cytochrome P450 pathway. Uh, any type of operative medications that were being used or post-op medications may be negatively impacted by it. Um, and so having a conversation about being able to, you know, stop use prior to surgery uh, and refrain from using until recovery has been complete would probably be prudent. However, there's no evidence at this time to kind of support that. Um, um, you know, we're still just doing research on basic pain. We haven't kind of moved into focusing on pain in specific areas like the post-operative settings. So more to come, hopefully. Thank you. 
And in terms of the role of the nurse, do you see the role of the nurse evolving uh, with impending legalization of cannabis? You know, I think nurses, particularly those that are working in, in primary care settings and roles, will, will probably have a, a, great, a much greater role in talking about harm reduction. You know, we may have more Canadians, although there's been some suggestion we're at saturation, but there may be more Canadians that are going to try cannabis. Uh, and so that will be, you know, a question that we probably need to add when we're doing any type of initial screening or uh, medical documentation of someone's health history. Uh, so, you know, nurses having a role in being able to detect problematic use, talking about the potential risks and harms and being educated about it and supporting patients and making, you know, evidence-informed uh, decisions, I see nurses playing a huge role in that. Uh, in terms of, you know, nurse practitioners, um, you know, we have heard rumblings uh, through different uh, groups and individuals that uh, the Canadian Medical Association is, is thinking that when legalization happens that, you know, their members should just kind of walk away of talking about uh, cannabis to patients and just say if you're interested in using it, you can go to your local store and pick it up yourself and use it. You know, if that comes to pass, which I hope it does not, um, I see nurses as having a huge role in talking to patients about the potential therapeutic use, the potential risks, in authorizing patients to access, you know, the, the medical system of cannabis in Canada. Um, and we have many patients that are still struggling uh, to access it and are still using illicit sources. Um, and so nurses may play a key role in ensuring that patients have access uh, to medical cannabis uh, in Canada. You know, and I also feel that, you know, nurses are well positioned to be, uh, you know, educating uh, not only patients but their fellow colleagues about cannabis as well as uh, conducting and assisting on, on research, which is desperately needed in this field. Thank you. And I just wanted to couch this next question uh, by uh, recommending that we do have a fair number of questions around uh, what RNs and NPs are allowed to give, uh, administer, uh, provide assistance, or authorize. So, you know, when there are questions, please, as uh, Dr. Balneves had said, um, you know, always consult your regulatory body. Uh, the college will will have um, information about what's um, what's possible in your jurisdiction. Um, but Dr. Belnews, are you able to provide a bit of uh, an overview of what RNs can give in terms of uh, give or authorize and NPs? So, you know, and this is where things get problematic. So, you know, RNs, let's start with NPs. So N NPs, you know, under federal legislation are allowed to authorize uh, patients access to, to, to legal medical cannabis through the licensed producers. They're allowed to sign the authorization forms. That being said, um, when you look at it by a college by college basis across the provinces and territories, only Ontario, as, as far as I'm aware, uh, have said that yes, our NPs are allowed to authorize medical cannabis use. The other provinces at this time are saying that no, NPs are not allowed to sign those authorization forms. Um, that being said, I have heard of a few nurses that are doing it anyways. Um, so, and in terms of the registered nurses, this is where things get a bit tricky because the legislation is saying that, you know, uh, not only can NPs authorize it, but they can assist in the administration of medical cannabis to someone that is, is legally authorized. Uh, and so assist to administer is, is a bit vague. It's not clear if that means, you know, helping someone that has, you know, a seizure disorder, you know, that's unable to put, you know, the, the dried cannabis into a vaporizer if you're allowed to, you know, you know, get access to the cannabis, put it into the vaporizer and hold it up to that patient's mouth for them to vaporize it. Or does that mean that you could actually take cannabis oil in a dropper form or in a syringe and insert it, you know, in, in the, you know, the buccal area of the mouth uh, and actually administer it to uh, the patient? Um, and 
what gets complicated is that um, we, we don't have the colleges necessarily being clear on that, and we have colleges that are actually saying, don't do anything, don't even administer it, don't handle it. Um, you know, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Nova Scotia have taken that route. We have other colleges that I think are still working on putting together their policies around this. Um, and, you know, so then you have patients then that are either relying on family members, uh, are leaving the grounds, are leaving the hospital, um, or you know, are, are you know, are, are unable to access it. So it's quite complicated. And then you know, you throw the institution uh, policies on top of that, uh, and then we have some institutions perhaps that even though it's federally allowed, it's allowed at the college level. They're saying that we don't want our health uh, providers to have anything to do with, uh, with herbal cannabis in our institution. So it's going to have to be the, the nurses doing the due diligence of working through each level and ensuring that they have the education and the skills and the knowledge uh, to feel comfortable in doing anything related to, to cannabis in a clinical or a community setting. Uh, and again, this is a rapidly evolving field. Uh, it's kind of like made. You know, the legislation came down, and then we have to find a way uh, to work around it. Uh, and it impacts at so many different levels. So um, I encourage you to ask the questions and become involved in some of that policy development, because it's so important that nurses are bringing, you know, not only the nursing perspective to those policies uh, and the implications, but also uh, the patient perspective as well. Thank you. We have a, a few questions around contraindications, one of which is um, if there's information regarding uh, drug interactions with concurrently prescribed medications. So as I mentioned, we're really at the beginning stages of, of understanding um, uh, interactions with other medications. And I, I just want to preface this by saying, you know, the reason we don't have a lot of research on herbal cannabis in particular is because of its legal status. Because it's been uh, a controlled substance, it's been almost impossible to do research on this in a clinical setting uh, for the past 30 years. So we have a lot of time to make up. You know, we have a little bit of research, some of it's preclinical research with animal models, some with humans that's more observational, that you know, any type of uh, sedating um, uh, uh, medication like a barbiturate or a sedative, that cannabis will work synergistically with it and potentially you know, ex exacerbate any of those kind of related uh, side effects, so in increasing people's sedation. Um, as I said, there's beginning research with the opioids, um, with a very small sample to suggest that it's you know, doesn't cannabis, the cannabinoids do not target the opioid receptors in the same way as an opioid does, and that it has a different impact. So we don't, we see better pain control perhaps, but we don't see increase in somnolence and sedation, uh, you know, repressed respiration and things like that. But we need more research. We, you know, we can't rely on, you know, studies with under 50 people to kind of make clinical um, you know, clinical sense of it. When it comes to things like birth control pills, um, we don't know at this time. You know, there hasn't been the research done. There's been some concern that, well, if it's processed through, you know, P450 and so are birth control pills, that it may have a negative impact uh, in terms of less absorption. Um, and so I'm seeing people say, you know, don't use cannabis at the same time as you're taking your medications. You know, try to offset them by four hours if you can, you know, um, when you think that, you know, the cannabis has, you know, you know, the half-life of it has, has been reached. You know, this is where we have to get more phar uh, pharmacological research done, uh, pharmacokinetic research done to really understand that. Uh, and so we're really, again, at the beginning stages of understanding it. So it's almost like a harm reduction, caution, beware kind of approach to that. Thank you. And similarly, there's a question about uh, whether or not um, older people using cannabis products are at risk for falls or memory loss, and, and recognizing that it's still early on in the uh, in the yeah. research. Yeah, I, I, I looked today to see if there was anything looking at cannabis in you know uh, 
older populations. What I've found is that there's more people that are older that are using cannabis, uh, but I haven't found anything related to falls. And I think then it just goes back to the impact on motor coordination. And we know that cannabis does have a short-term impact on motor coordination. And especially if uh, an older person is naive to cannabis and is using it for the first time, I think, yes, they're probably, you know, theoretically there is a link uh, potentially between increased risk of falls. In terms of memory issues, cannabis most definitely impacts short and long term. Most of the research has been focused on chronic high use um, and in terms of whether someone using it medically is going to see profound effect on their memory, we're not clear on. Um, you know, there's been some conversation in people using dementia, having dementia and using cannabis to help control things like sundowning. Um, and you know we're not I'm not seeing any research to suggest it's going to improve memory. And, you know my thought is that when it has a negative impact on memory that we will you know see that same impact and in fact we may see a, you know a worse impact on adults but that's not backed by evidence yet. So I think if someone is using cannabis for the first time is fairly naive to it they you know need to make sure that they are you know their safety uh, around their movements afterwards, and that you know perhaps they start using it at bedtime uh, when they're not going to be so much at risk for falls necessarily, uh, and there needs to be a conversation about those potential risks. Thank you. We also have a question uh, about methods of administration or use, so um, whether or not uh, juicing is a better way mm -hmm. to consume cannabis as opposed to smoking or other modes of consumption. So, you know, there's not much research on juicing, and from what I've seen anecdotally, most people say cannabis juicing is, is a waste of, of cannabis and a lot of cannabis. That I've seen some conversation that there has to, that the heating of cannabis is necessary in order to fully access all the cannabinoids. Um, and that the way our gut is structured and our enzymes, it's very difficult for us to kind of break down cannabis and in, 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 in to have the same effect as when it's actually heated. Um, so I haven't seen any research around juicing at this time. We're just starting to get the research on vaporization coming out. Um, you know, I've seen some people suggest that the oils is a way for them to get the 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 edible effect that's more uh, sustaining. Um, and, you know, it's now being produced in a way that is very similar to any other type of liquid medication that we have with, you know, a syringe attached to it. And um, people are able to kind of pull up a mill, you know, one milliliter and, and, and use it. Um, but I'm not seeing a lot of evidence around juicing. And, and edibles right now in Canada are, are not legal uh, unless people are producing it themselves in their own home. And just a, a comment around vaporization. We uh, just had this month uh, the first study come out to look at safety around vaporization. Uh, and there's been some concerns raised that depending on the, the oil substrate that is used uh, by uh, the licensed producer or by the individual themselves in terms of concentrating uh, you know, THC and CBD into an oil, that some of the oils are actually giving off formaldehyde, which is a, a known carcinogen. So it's going to be important if people are using a, a cannabis oil and are wanting to vaporize it, um, that they use, um, that they make sure that they're using an oil that's not going to result uh, in the formation of formaldehyde. So I'm seeing some of the licensed producer using olive oil or sesame oil uh, that doesn't have that same impact. Um, another issue around just safety and route of administration, you know. Smoking cannabis, many people like it because they can titrate it easier and they get a more immediate effect. You know, from a harm reduction perspective, people are encouraging vaporization instead because there's a thought that because of the, the, the amount of heat applied that we're not seeing the same types of particulates uh, as we see in smoked cannabis. Um, but we need more research to understand the safety of all the different routes and whether there's any concerns around them. And building on that, we do have a question about if there's research around secondhand smoke related to uh, cannabis smoking. You know, um, I think there's, there's, there's been some 
research. I have to be honest, it's not a field that I've, I've uh, delved into uh, extensively at this time. We know that people exposed to, to secondhand cannabis smoke, uh, you know, their blood levels do show an exposure uh, to, two, to THC. Um, in terms of its impact on lung health, uh, I haven't seen the research myself. Um, I would assume theoretically that there may still be some harms to, uh, you know, lung tissue. Uh, you may still see some of, of the effects, uh, some of the side effects that we talked about today. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't, I'm not up to date on that research to be able to kind of comment further on it. Thank you. Sorry, I, I do understand that the, you know, the breadth of um, of questions are, some of them are, are outside of the, the scope of the presentation, but I appreciate you uh, taking a stab at them. In the interest of time, I think I'll try and uh, summarize uh, or collate a few questions uh, and just pose one more question for you. Um, sure. And so we have some uh, attendees who are looking for resources on cannabis cannabis edu education or literature used for this presentation. So in addition to the web links you've kindly provided and the slides I wanted to point out that are available at the bottom um, of the screen, do you have any other uh, literature or, or resources that you recommend our, our listeners or attendees uh, seek out? You know, the ones I've listed are, are really where I, I got a lot of my, my, um, my knowledge. Um, in addition, to be honest, because this field is evolving so rapidly, it, it's hard to recommend a, a book, uh, you know, that uh, you, you can turn to um, because the research is, is coming out so fast. So I have to be honest and say I use a lot of PubMed. Uh, and CINAHL, you know, PubMed in particular, where or, or clinicaltrials.gov, where I'm actually looking at the the actual articles that are coming out. You know, um, I would say that if you're wanting further education, you know, the uh, CCIC, the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, you know, has a, an excellent uh, in-person, and I believe they also have an online education program um, for individuals that are interested in learning more about the pharmacology of cannabis and as well as some of its clinical applications to specific health conditions. Um, and, you know, the American Cannabis Nurses Association also has a, a, a program uh, specifically for nurses, uh, and it's really focused more on medical cannabis, but also kind of touches on some of the potential risks. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, we do, we're starting to see um, some journals. We have the Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research Journal that uh, just came out in 2015. Um, so they're you know, a journal that if you're looking to, to, to kind of hear some of the latest research, it's a great one to kind of access. Otherwise, you know, I'll have to be honest, uh, you know, 10 years ago I could barely get an article published in a journal around cannabis. It was not something that people were interested in publishing. Uh, now we're seeing, you know, articles come out all over. You know, and I would recommend if, you, if you're wanting to get some summaries, you know, go into PubMed, type in cannabis and, you know, limit it to reviews and you will find that there's a lot of uh, systematic reviews that are starting to be published uh, around cannabis, both due to its potential harm as well as its potential benefit. Uh, and so that might be a good place for many of you to start in terms of gaining that knowledge. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again for your presentation, presentation on Cannabis in Canada and lending your time and expertise. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees. We hope this session stimulated your thinking about nursing practice. Here we have uh, contact information uh, for uh, Dr. Balneves on the right-hand side and uh, for one of my colleagues, Josette Roussel, and myself, Carrie Schuhendler, if you have additional questions. Um, you can access recordings of our webinars with, uh, and download your certificate of participation by visiting CNA's YouTube channel. As was mentioned, this is the last, the fifth webinar in a series on um, uh, substance use trends in Canada. So if you were unable to attend the other webinars, they are archived uh, on the YouTube channel. And just some information for those of you attending, you can save the date for CNA's biennial convention, which will be in Ottawa uh, June 18th to 20th of next year. And thank you all so much for your time and attention, and thank you again, Dr. Belneve. Thank you so much, Carrie. It's been a real pleasure. And again, any questions, please just uh, send them my way. I'll do my best to answer them.
Thanks.